our discussion of the, and you can follow along with me, of the power of positive confession continues. And as I said last time, uh, this lesson is about the application of the word of God to your life and to the circumstances in your life. Now, in this book by the same name that Apostle Price wrote, he shows us how he took the word, believed the word, and confessed the word. Those are the three stages. Know the word, believe the word, speak the word, so that God can confirm the word in your life. And we saw this. I saw it firsthand. You've heard him speak about it, and I've talked about it how his doing those simple steps led to a total revolution in his life in terms of what he was experiencing, in terms of the restoration that took place, which we will talk about a little bit more today. Now, as we pick up our discussion of the power of positive confession, let's take some time to review some of the key points that we have established already. Uh, this lesson has a little way to go but I think we should take some time now to look at some of the key things that we have already learned uh, by way of, re of review. Now these points clarify what the power of positive confession is and shows us how we can employ the dynamic law of confession to change our life. These are some of the major things that we have learned. First, I'm at first by the way, if you're following me, First, we learn that the word confession is a little bit more than what we thought it uh, was, because we always thought of confession as going you know, before the priest or someone or to one another and confessing our sins, which is uh, uh, certainly a part of it. But the word confession is derived from the Greek, the Greek translation of the Bible, from the word homologio. And you have it right there, homologio, H-O-M-O-L-O-G-E-O. -O -O. And this is a compound word formed by lego, L-E-G-O, which means to say, and homos, which means the same thing. So literally, the meaning of homologia is to agree with or say the same thing. Now, as applied to the word of God, homologia simply means to say the same thing as God says about you and your circumstances. And the Bible is full of the things that he says about us and our circumstances. And by the way, they're all positive. They're all good. Now, it is confessing or saying what God's word says about you. That's what confession is. Now, when you learn to confess or say what God says about you, you are well on your way to doing what we're talking about, and that is applying the word to your life. Now, with knowledge of the original Greek word for confession, we can see that the traditional notion of confession that relates to confessing sins is not the most dominant purpose of confessing in the Bible. There is much more in the Bible about positive confession than we realize. We find that everything God says about us is positive and beneficial, and his words are words of life and good and not of death and evil. Therefore, to confess God's word, as Apostle Price did, is to say the same thing about your life and your circumstances as God does. Thus, confessing or saying what God says about you is always positive and is always a positive confession. Now, the second thing we learn is that God's word regulates the law of confession, and this is important. It's the word that regulates the law of confession. And his word is the foundation of his system, that system in which we as believers have to operate or must operate if we are to benefit by the gifts and promises that are contained in the word in the Bible. And Apostle Price describes God's system as follows, and you have it right there. He says, God has designed his system to work by his word, that is, what the Bible is for, for us to study and learn his word. God has given us his word so that we would know his word, so that we would believe his word, so that we would say his word, so that he would confirm his word in our lives. This is the way God's system works. 
Now, to repeat, as believers, we are encouraged to know, believe, and say or confess the word of God so he can confirm his word in our lives. And in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 19 and 20, we see that confirmation and process and operation. We see how God confirmed his word. So let's read those scriptures. This is Mark chapter 16, verses 19 and 20. At 19, it says, so then, and this is at the end of the Gospel of Mark, and it's at the end of Jesus' ministry here on earth. At verse 19, it says, so then, after the Lord had spoken to them, them being the disciples, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 20, and they, the disciples, went out and preached everywhere, preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. Now, it's important to see in verse 20 that where it says the Lord confirmed the word, he confirmed the word that was preached, the word that was spoken by the disciples. It didn't say he confirmed the disciples, he confirmed the word that they preached, the word that they spoke. In the same way for us, God confirms his word that we speak. Now, since God's word regulates the law of confession, this means that you simply can't confess anything that comes into your head, anything that you want. You know, for example, you could confess, wake up one morning and say, you know what, I want to be the next king of England. <laughs> well, we know that that's not going to happen. Now, actually, you've had people who have done this, by the way. I'm not making it up. But obviously, that's not going to happen because there is a royal secession there based on blood and family and so forth. So you can't just confess anything. What you confess and claim by way of your confession must line up with the word of God if you expect God to confirm the word in your confession. You can claim and confess what you want if this is what God says about you or your situation. For example, the word says a lot about healing, that by a stripe you are healed. You can claim your healing based on the word. That's clearly in line with God's word. Now, obviously, since knowing God's word is the first step to operating in his system, there is an urgent need to study and learn the word. And that is why we teach the word here at Crenshaw Christian Center. You cannot confess his word if you don't know it. Now, if God's word is not confessed or preached, if his word is not confessed or preached, there is nothing for God to confirm. If nothing comes out of your mouth, then guess what? God is going to confirm nothing. That is why, as I just said before, uh, we have always emphasized teaching the word here at Crenshaw Christian Center as Apostle Price has always taught us. Now, the third key point that we've learned from the lesson so far is this. We learned that Jesus was enunciating the law of confession, covering, saying, and believing with his declaration in Mark eleven twenty-three. 23. That's a very familiar scripture. We go to it often here, Mark eleven twenty-three. 23. You have it right there. And these are the words of Jesus. And we know they're the words of Jesus because they're written in red. Jesus says this in Mark eleven twenty three, 23. For assuredly, which means without a doubt, I say to you, whoever says to the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. If he says it, if he believes it in his heart, then those things that he says will be done. Now, as I pointed out last time, your confession or saying must be accompanied by genuine belief in your heart. In other words, you could read the Bible and start confessing something that you read there, but if you really don't believe it, it's not going to have the effect of having God confirm this. You have to believe it in your heart. Now, I devised the little equation that you see there to make it simple. S plus B equals A. Saying plus believing equals achieving. If you say it, you believe it, you can achieve it because God's going to confess it in your life. S plus B equals A. Saving, I mean saying 
plus believing equals achieving. When you say God's word and believe it, you give God the nod to confirm his word in your life. In many examples that I gave from Apostle Price's life, we saw how the law of confession that was practiced by him resulted in really, truly dramatic and positive achievements in his life. And by what you say or confess, you give God the nod to move on your behalf, the same way as Apostle Price did. Now, fourth, we learned another law that says this, your faith will never rise above the level of your confession. Your faith will never rise above the level of what you confess out of your mouth. In Romans 12.3, and you're familiar with this, in Romans 12.3, 12th 12 chapter, third uh, verse, uh, we see where we are told this, and I'm quoting, God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. Now your Bible might say a measure of faith. It's more correct, the measure. And the reason is, is that he, if it says God dealt to each one a measure of faith, that means he could have given you a certain quantity and you a certain quantity and everybody would have different quantities. The measure of faith means that everybody got the same measure. And that's important because that is absolutely true. Uh, thereafter, after we get our measure of faith, it's up to each person to develop this God-given faith. One clear measure of the growth in the level of your faith is the level of your confession. Your confession is what you say and believe about God's word. As I outlined to you earlier, Apostle Price confessed and stood on those things that God had said about his finances, his health, his fears and worries, and other promises God had made in his word about restoration. And we saw how Apostle's faith for these things rose to the level of his confession. He actually confessed these things daily, audibly. He verbally said them. And he confessed these daily, as I said. He confessed God's word and experienced firsthand God's confirmation process. That's why he can write about it. That's why he can tell us about it. He actually lived through this, and I'm going to review a little bit of this later, uh, what I covered in the lesson earlier. Again, it's the confluence of faith and confession that gives God the nod to confirm his word in your life as he did in, in the life of Apostle Price. Now, confluence just means it's the intersection of faith and confession. It's where the two intersect that gives God the nod to confirm his word that you've spoken. Now, the fifth thing that we learn is that there are at least three parties who need to hear your positive confession. You, God, and Satan. The first party is you. You need to hear the positive healing and comforting words from God because this steals your soul and gives you hope. And also because faith comes by hearing and by hearing, and you can develop faith when it's spoken out of your own mouth. As a matter of fact, Apostle Price says this is one of the best sources of developing faith is what you say. That's why you've got to be careful about what you say, because if you're saying negative, destructive things or evil things, then that can also become manifest in your life. So it's very important to, as Ella Iva had a whole series on this, watch your mouth. Watch what you say. Now, uh, the principal party, I'm in the next paragraph, who needs to hear his words coming out of your mouth is God. God needs to hear, you, he needs to hear you confess or speak his word so that he can move to confirm his word in your life as we saw him confirm the word in Mark 16, 20, which we just cited. And of course, as we saw in Apostle Price's life. God has told us this in Jeremiah 1.12, which says, and this is God speaking, I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. In other words, he's just watching, eagerly waiting to hear his word so he can confirm it. Now, this is the Amplified Bible's version of this, uh, but I think it's one of the better ones. Now, the third party who needs to hear you confess what God says about you or about your situation is Satan. 
your confession of God's word becomes your protection against anything negative about the situation that Satan can hear from you and use to attack or destroy you. The word is also the weapon that you speak and use in fending off the attacks of the devil. <laughs> it's so important to know the word because when you are attacked with illness or an attack where your finances are being attacked, where you see that you may not have enough for rent this month and so forth, you need to know the word. And you, need to, and you also need to know what you should have been doing up to that point too, and I'll get into that. But it's, uh, the use of the word is your weapon that we see in Ephesians 6, 17. It's a very familiar scripture where we are told to take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, this sword is one of the weapons in the arsenal of the Holy Spirit that he uses to aid us in periods of distress. Now, you may not have ever heard this before, but when you just look at the scripture, what does it say? The sword of the spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the weapon, one of the weapons in the arsenal of the Holy Spirit that he uses to work on our behalf in the way of protection and fending off evil and attacks that he uses on our behalf when we are in periods of distress. When we confess or speak God's word, we signal the Holy Spirit to move on our behalf, wielding his mighty sword the sword of God's word. Now, this is why the Holy Spirit is the most important person in our life on earth. Let me repeat that. The Holy Spirit is the most important person in our life on this earth. Why? Because he is here with us. And even more importantly, he is within us forever to comfort, to heal, and to protect us. And unfortunately, Christians either don't know this or they fail to realize this. Uh, uh, you know, when you're in trouble, I mean, when some are in trouble, they go running and screaming and looking everywhere when they really need to just sit and get quiet and look within. The Holy Spirit is right there, ready for you to ask for his help. He's there to help us. And you remember when we were given the Holy Spirit, when Jesus, he will be, he will abide with us forever. He's here forever. He's not going anywhere. You don't have to strain. You don't have to beg for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, you're, if you're born again, the Holy Spirit resides uh, within you. Now, this power of the word for us is confirmed in Psalm 107, 20, which says, he, he being God, sent his word and healed them healed us and delivered them, delivered us from their destructions, from our destructions. Now, in the life of Jesus, we saw how effective he was in using the word to defeat the destructive attacks of Satan. And he, in, in so doing this, it's not an accident that this is in the Bible. He gave us this example for us to follow. Now, when challenged by the devil, Jesus confessed or spoke the word as his only defense. And this put the devil to flight. He didn't try to summon down legions of angels and uh, legions of fighters from heaven. He just summoned up the word, which meant that he had to know the word. So we're going to see this a little bit later. Earlier in this message a few weeks, a few weeks ago, I, dis I discussed how Apostle Price confessed the word to kick the destructive and defeating, defeating attacks of Satan out of his life. And Satan had his boot on Apostle's neck, as he has described. I mean, he was down for the count. And I was there and I saw it. Broke, busted, and disgusted. He couldn't pay for anything. At one point, he was working three jobs, still couldn't make ends meet. And a good part of this time, he was a minister of the gospel. Uh, and still couldn't make ends meet because he didn't have the understanding of the word that he developed later. And, and I'll talk about this. Now, let's turn and look. You don't have to turn because it's right in front of you, right below. Let's turn and look again at the example Jesus gave us that helped Apostle Price and which we can 
use, and it'll certainly help us. Again, when challenged by the devil, Jesus confessed or spoke the word as his only defense. And again, this put the devil to flight. And we see this recorded. It's recorded in more than one place, but we're going to look at where it's recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Verse 1. It says, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, I put on the side Acts 10.38. If you don't remember what Acts 10.38 is, it talks about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power. I mean, with, with, I mean, with the Holy Spirit and with power. And after being anointed, he went about healing all who were demon-possessed and all who were sick. The important thing here is that until Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, he did not really start his ministry. So obviously, if Jesus needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit to conduct what he was conducting, because remember, he functioned on earth as the son of man, not as the son of God. So he needed the Holy Spirit. So if he needed it, we certainly need it. So he was filled with the Holy Spirit and was led uh, by the Spirit into the wilderness. Uh, uh, verse 2, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. So if he was the son of God, he probably wouldn't have been hungry. <laughs> he was the son of God, by the way. He was always the son of God, but I mean, he was not functioning as the son of God. He functioned as the son of man. So we, he was hungry. So verse 3, and the devil said to him, this is tempting him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Verse 4, but Jesus answered to him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the original says, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is written, and what I did is I put where it's written after each one of these so you know. It, it is written in Deuteronomy 8.3. This tells you that Jesus knew the old scriptures that we call at least the first five books of the Bible, the book of Moses, the Pentateuch, the first books, five books of the Bible. He knew them and he could quote them. And he's giving us the example right here that you can't quote the word, you can't say it's written if you don't know what was written. Verse five, then the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Verse 6, and the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Who delivered it to him? Say it, up, say it loud. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden. Seven, that's why he's the God of this world. Verse 7, therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. All will be yours. Verse 8, and Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And I mentioned uh, 1 Samuel 7, 3, it's written there, but it's written throughout really the, the Old Testament, certainly in the early books of Exodus and Deuteronomy and some of the, about serving uh, your God and serving him only. It is written. But again, he had to know it was written. So he knew the old scriptures. Nine, verse nine. Then he, he being Satan or the devil, brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Now, that's one of the taxes he uses against us humans. When you are attacked with an illness, Satan will say in your mind, if you are such a strong believer, now you know that your mother died of the same thing and her mother died of the same thing. If you are such a strong Christian, then stand on it. He'll challenge you, he'll challenge you. But he'll remind you that others in your family died of that, 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 that illness and that disease and so forth. So he's saying in so many words, how do you think you're gonna beat it? So if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. But verse 10 says, for it is written. Uh, oh, by the way, this is the devil quoting the Bible here. 
This is a devil saying this. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And verse 11, and their hands shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. This is the devil quoting Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12 specifically. You could go, I put it there so you can go check it out. So the devil knew the word also. Verse 12, and Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And this is written throughout uh, uh, the, the Bible. But I, I cite Deuteronomy 6.16. You'll find it there. 13, now when the devil had ended every temptation, which means that there probably were more than these, he departed from him until an opportune time and so forth. And that's what he's looking in terms of our lives. He's looking for an opportune time. You remember the scripture? He moves around like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. He can only devour you with what you give him. You give him something to devour you with, with your negative thoughts, with your negative confessions, with your negative beliefs, or with your unbelief in the word of God. Now, just as Jesus did, I'm in the last paragraph, just as Jesus did in this example from Luke 4, we can speak the word when we are attacked. When attacked with an illness, you can say, it is written where in Isaiah 53, 5, and 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2, 24, that by his stripes, I am healed. And I put I am healed because Isaiah says, we're healed. First Peter says, are healed. So between the two, you can get I am healed. Or I is healed if that works better for you. Anyway, we are healed. But you can, you can actually quote the word that it's written. When it appears that you don't have enough money for food or housing or clothing, uh, other basic needs, you can say it is written in Philippians 4, 19, that my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You can stand on that. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. When you have suffered loss, had things taken away from you or suffered a, a barren or wasted period in your life, you can say as Apostle Price did, it is written in Joel, J-O-E-L, chapter two, verse 25, that he will restore the years that were wasted, the years that the swarming locust has eaten. In other words, he'll restore what has been taken away from you. And in Job, chapter 42, at the end of Job, chapter 42, verse 10, where it's written, and the Lord restored Job's losses. Remember, Job had lost everything. He restored Job's losses, and indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And finally, to respond to that feeling of being unloved because you've been abandoned by family, maybe by mother or father or both, or parents by children or by a spouse, or have not found your mate in life and you're feeling unloved, you can say this. It is written in Jeremiah 31, verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. The Lord has appeared to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. God always loved you. So you can never say that you are without love or you are loveless. The love of God is everlasting and forever. And you can also say what's written in Romans 8, 38, 39. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. These are among my favorite scriptures. Verse 38 says this, Romans 8, 38 says this, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us, separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. So you always have love. Remember uh, the scripture that says God is love? Remember it says God is spirit? And we talk about being made in the image and likeness of God. So we know that we are spirit. But don't you know that you are love too? You're made in the image and likeness of God. So you're made in and of love. So you could never be without love because that's what you're made of. You may not act like it, but that's what you're made of. <laughs> now, you need to know and confess that nothing, no thing can separate you from God's love that is everlasting. This is what God's word says, so we should speak or confess his word because this is what his word says to and about us. This is the very definition of confession, which is saying the same thing 
that God says about us. And remember, it was Jesus who first told us that we should say what Father God says. We see this in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 12, verses 49 and 50. This is Jesus speaking. In verse 49, this is John 12, 49 and 50. Verse 49, Jesus says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command. The command is his word. What I should say, what I should speak. Verse 50, and I know that his command, again his word, is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Through his command in the Bible, which is his word, God has given us the words that we should speak or confess. And like Jesus, we can know that God's word is everlasting and positive and beneficial to us. Again, in our positive confession, we are saying and agreeing with God or what God says about us about our life and our circumstances. And following this practice of the law of confession, we are imitating Apostle Christ as he imitated Christ. Now, the sixth thing that we learn is this. The study so far reveals again, something we already know, the important role played by faith and the Holy Spirit in our victorious overcoming life. Two are indispensable. In the examination of Apostle Price's life, we saw the vital role faith played and the Holy Spirit played in the evolving story of his personal success and achievement, achievement in his personal and material growth. Apostle Price learned what the Word of God said about faith and how faith was the key to appropriating things needed on earth from the spiritual kingdom of God. See, everything that we need already exists in the spiritual realm which is right side by side. You can say side by side this way or side by side this way. It already exists in the spiritual realm. And the way you reach into the spiritual realm and appropriate the things that you need is by faith. The currency in the spiritual realm is faith. The currency in our realm is what? M-O-N-E-Y. But in the spiritual realm is faith. That's how you bring them from the spiritual realm into the material realm. Now, with regard to faith, a price of price learn the faith essentials, what I'm calling the faith essentials from the word. From Romans 12, 3, he learned that God has dealt to each one the measure of faith, which we talked about already. Now, this turned the light on for him, and it should for everyone if it's the first time you're hearing this. He's dealt to each one the measure of faith. And what he learned and what he realized, apostle, and we should know, is that there's no one, whether it's super saint the person who has the largest church here in the world, in the United States or anywhere else, he doesn't have any more faith than you have. He has, he has not been given any more faith than you have. But it's what you do with that faith that counts. Uh, from Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4. From your scripture, Habakkuk 2, 4. Dr. Price learned that the just shall live by his faith. In other words, it's a lifestyle. It's a way of living 24-7. 365, all the time, live by faith. Here, Dr. Price also learned that in terms of daily living, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, which all of you know by sight, I mean by, I mean by <laughs> you, you know it even without hearing, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We've been hearing this for the past 50 years. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith when we rely on what the word of God says and not on what the circumstances that we see say. These initial faith essentials were rounded out by Apostle Price, who learned from uh, Hebrews 11.6, uh, Hebrews 11.6, that without faith, it's impossible to please him, the him being God. So without faith, you can't even please God. So a key contribution from all that he learned from his study, from his experience, that Apostle Price to write this very key book, seminal book, I call it. Seminal meaning it's a foundation leading to other things. Book on faith, how faith works. He tells us how faith works. And we get from Apostle Price his definition, definition of faith, which is faith is acting on what you believe. If you believe what the word says, then you act on that belief. I gave you this example uh, last week, I think it was. The Bible says 
Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Acting on that word, what do you do? In other words, you act it, you believe it. To act on it means that you act like you're strong. In fact, the, the word says, let the weak say I am strong. You act as if you're strong. You act as if. Now, at the same time, in his study of the word, Apostle Bryce gained this tremendous insight into the essential need and function uh, of the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the importance of the Holy Spirit was emphasized by Jesus when he told the disciples not to depart from Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. And this is referring to the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, additional clarification of the Holy Spirit was provided in Acts 2.4. These are scriptures that you know. Acts 2.4, which states, and they, the disciples, were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is speaking in other tongues, your prayer language. So we know that the Holy Spirit is our power source and that speaking in other tongues represents our prayer language with which we can speak directly to God. Only God knows what you're saying when you pray in tongue uh, to him. And we should always remember that the Holy Spirit at work in us and for us is God at work for us and God in us. As I have pointed out to you before, Apostle Price did not make any great progress in his spiritual or material growth until after he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's how important it is. He had gone nearly 17 years as a minister of the gospel and he went nowhere in his ministry and really nowhere in his life. In fact, it looked like he lost more each year by the year because I was there. So he wrote a book explaining his experiences here so that we can understand the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit better. And that's the Holy Spirit, the missing ingredient. Now, he has several other books on the Holy Spirit, but that's, that's the foundation book that he describes his experience. And he had a tough time at it. And so if anybody has difficulty receiving this gift of the Holy Spirit, you read his book and you'll see that uh, you may not be the only one. Now, let's look at number seven, the seventh thing that we learned from the study so far. When you take God's word, meaning you know his word and believe it and confess it, he can bring about restoration in your life and to your life. Now, among other promises of restoration, Jeremiah 30, 17, in Jeremiah 30, 17, God promises to restore your health. In Psalm 51, 12, uh, this is David praying, by the way, to God to restore the joy of your salvation. So, you may not understand it the way it's written there. He's actually asking God to restore in me the joy that I felt when I was saved, your joy of my salvation. Because you remember David did a lot of things, so he sort of got, he got out of the flow for a time. So he's saying, restore me the joy that I felt at my point of salvation. That's what that means. Uh, and in Joel 2.25, uh, which I quoted already, it says, to restore the years that were wasted, the years the swarming locust has eaten. In other words, the things that were eaten up out of your life, taken from you. And in Job 42, 10, to restore all that you lost and what was taken from you as everything had been taken away from Job. Now, as I discussed with you before, Apostle Price began to confess these promises of restoration as part of his daily prayers and affirmation. And as years passed, I witnessed, I witnessed seeing all the losses that Dr. Price had, Price had suffered being restored back to him. The restoration included all that Dr. Price had lost when he was forced to declare bankruptcy. They came and they repossessed everything. I, mean, I went to the house. They had come in and cleaned everything out. They repossessed his car. Uh, and we see in Job 42.10 how God restored everything that Job had lost. He also re restored all that Fred Price had lost. And I mentioned to you that his car had been repossessed, but he was given years later, two luxury automobiles, a Rolls Royce and then a Bentley. I would call that some kind of restoration. He didn't have to buy them. They were, they were given to him. Now, in another confession, 
uh, uh, Fred, I, I remember I was referring to him as Fred Price, which is what he was at the time. And uh, that's what I call him, my brother-in-law. He confessed for years that one day Sun Wong was going to give him a million dollars. One day, it actually happened. A successful business owner and member of Crenshaw presented Dr. Price with a check for one million dollars. Then he gave him another check, which covered the taxes that he would have to pay on the million, so he'd have a clear million dollars. Now, I don't have this down here, but you need to understand that you just can't get up and confess anything. He was speaking that someone, he didn't say the person was going to give him a million dollars, but he had laid the groundwork for this. And let me just mention a couple of scriptures that pertain to this. Uh, in Job 22, 28, it says, you shall also decree a thing and it shall be established for you. He was decreeing something here, according to the word. But I like what the Amplified Bible says about this. And it says, and this is not in the notes, so you're not gonna find them there. But I should have put them in there, but I didn't. The Amplified Version says this, you shall also decide and decree a thing and it shall be established for you. And the light of God, meaning God's favor, shall shine upon you. You shall decide. See, it's a decision that's important. Apostle Price decided that he was going to live by God's word. He was going to live a holy life. He was going to live a life of integrity. He was going to give. He was going to tithe. He was going to do the thing the word decided. After you make that decision and act on it, then you can decree something and so forth. Now, decide is the key. You have to decide that you're going to live according to the word. And so this is what he did. So they became dedicated tithers, as I told you. And they started with 10%, and they eventually moved it up to 40%. They were tithing 40% of their annual income, which had really grown to be quite substantial. You know, it's a speaker around the world and 50-some books and so forth, and, you know, receiving a salary from Crenshaw, and people constantly giving him. His, an his annual income became quite substantial, so they were up to giving 40% of that away. So... He could confess that someone someday was going to give him a million dollars based on the word. Luke 6.38, which Ella Ivor quoted to us this morning. What does Luke 6.38 say? Give and it shall be given unto you. How? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall who? Shall men give into your bosom. It's going to be given by a man and so forth. And for the... For, with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. In other words, if you give a lot, you'll get a lot. And this is confirmed in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 6 and 8. This is another scripture that we cite here almost every Sunday when it comes to tithing. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 8. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. In other words, if you give a little, you're going to get a little. If you give a lot, you're going to get a lot. And eight, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having a sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So this was the case of Apostle Pratt. He said he would really be brought to tears. He would be at a ministry or he'd be at some situation where he wanted to give to the good purpose that was being discussed or he wanted to give it to him and he just didn't have the money. He acting on the word, develop an abundance and a sufficiency in all things, that he has an, an abundance for every good work. Now, so that came to pass. And I told you how he, God made the other major restoration in his life, and that was the restoration of a son. Their firstborn son, at age eight, had been killed in an automobile accident, crossing the street coming from school. Well, at age 45, Dr. Betty became pregnant, and uh, it surprised them, and, uh, but that was part of that restoration. And of course, uh, Fred, Fred, Fred Price IV was born. We call him Fred Jr. today to separate him from his father, but it was Fred, Frederick Price IV was born. And uh, we know that uh, a famous prophet who was speaking at Crenshaw at the time that Betty was pregnant. At that time, they didn't know, you know, the, the, the identity of, of the, uh, you know, the gender of the child. He prophesied that the child would be a boy and that he would grow up to become a tremendous 
asset to the apostle in the ministry. And I said, apostle was wondering, he says, I'm 50 now. When, when this boy gets to be 20, I'll be 70. How is he going to help me in the ministry? Well, all of you know how he helped in, in, in the ministry. He is a pastor of Grinshaw Christian Center, and he's already established himself as one of the renowned young ministers in the nation. So since we all know, I'm in the second paragraph on page 10, from uh, Acts 10, 34, this is where it is in the Bible. It's one of the several places it is. We know that God is no respecter of persons. We know that what he did by way of restoration for Apostle Price, he can do it for you if you believe and confess his word as Apostle Price did. Now, eight, we learn that God wants us to copy him. Now, the entire lesson on the power of positive confession is about confessing or speaking God's word. It's about using the mouth to say or speak or confess the word. We reference the warning that God gave us about the mouth in Proverbs 18.21, scripture that we quote here so often. Proverbs 18.21, which says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, in your mouth, in what you say. This power of the tongue, of the spoken word, is what God illustrated for us in the story of creation in the first chapter of Genesis. You remember this. In Genesis, we saw how God created the whole world and everything in it by speaking things into existence. So why does God want us to say things with our mouth? He wants us to pattern ourselves after him. Everything that God did, he did with his mouth. We see this very clearly in the first chapter of Genesis where, he, where it says, and God said, and God said, and God said. You will notice that nothing came into being until after God said it. It is no accident that the Bible records how God prefaced all of his creation with spoken words. We read, then God said, let there be light. He might have said, light be, and there was light. Light did not appear until after God said it. So again, why does God record the creation in the Bible this way? Apostle Price writes this at the bottom of the page. God wants us to copy him. God is a talker. God is a sayer. God said, let there be be what? There to be divine health in my body. There to be what? There to be no sickness or disease in my body. However, I need to say it. I need to say it. Remember, God requires us to confess not what we feel, not what we see, not what we understand, but what his word says, because our faith will never rise above the level of our confession. Now, let me take a few more minutes and end this by talking about what keeps some of us from confessing uh, the positive words of God? When we speak or confess God's word over our life, we are confessing that what we believe that the word says is true for us now. But when examining their life, it appears to be, it appears to be that some might find it difficult to see their circumstances in a more favorable light because they're looking at what they see, what they have, what they think, and what they understand. And one of the main things that keep an individual from moving beyond point A to point C, in other words, moving out of a less than positive situation to a more positive one, is that uh, they love to play the blame game. In other words, they love to wallow in who's responsible for this, who caused this, who did this to me, and so forth. So their focus is on putting a blame for their plight on someone or someone else. The usual suspects are God, the devil, Satan, circumstances of birth, lack of opportunity, those people, whoever they are, or, or what happened to them in a past uh, period in their life. But a price, Apostle Price points out this, that this ability to change one's life by changing one's words places the opportunity and the responsibility for change squarely in the hand and mouth of the individual. God is not the problem. In this lesson so far, we have learned an important fact about God, as stated by Apostle Price. And this fact is this. God clearly tells us what he will do for us in his word. He clearly sets this forth, and we teach this all the time here, from what he's going to do for us, his promises, uh, his gifts. And after having established this in the Bible, he then deals with us on the basis of what we confess and do about his promises. It's what you do about his promises. In addition to all of his promises in his word, God tells us how special we are in Ephesians 1, 4, where he says, he chose us in him 
before the foundation of the world. In other words, we were chosen by him before the beginning of time. And in Jeremiah 29, 11, where we read this, this is God speaking, for I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God is not gonna do anything to destroy you. A positive confession of God's word will cause him to confirm his word in your life. A negative confession will nullify his word that, there, that the word is there to work on your behalf. Now the other culprit is Satan. You know, the devil made me do it, or the devil did this, or the devil blocked me from this. Satan can only affect your life adversely when you give him the opportunity. And you give him the opportunity when you confess the negative circumstances in your life. What you see, think, or understand. What you feel. For example, you're ill. The doctor said, you know, this could be fatal. So you take him at his word and you begin to react to it as, as if this is the end. And you say it, you know, this is the end. And it's so funny, my father used to, every year used to say, you know, this is my last year. And so, but obviously he didn't really believe it because he lived 40 years after that. So, so you, you, if you really believe it, uh, it'll have some impact. So, uh, so let's look at uh, what we need to do in terms of, of not giving place to the devil. And we see this in James uh, chapter 4, verse 7, James, towards the end of the Bible, uh, before Revelation, James, Peter, John, and Revelation. James 4, 7 says this, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In both instances of submitting and resisting, you use the word. You submit to God by submitting to his word, by believing and confessing this word. The devil can only affect you potentially with thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. Apostle Price taught a whole series on this that he can attempt to pollute your mind with. And you can resist the devil when you confess or speak God's word against these attacks the same way we saw Jesus do in Luke Gospel 4, verses 1 through 13. Other people blame circumstances. Circumstances are not the problem. People cite all kinds of things, being poor, their race, not being educated, being too young, being too old, all kinds of things. Uh, and people, you will hear people say, you know, I was fired 22 years ago and they ruined my life and they've been walking around all those 22 years saying they ruined my life. And I like to say, they may have ruined your life 22 years ago, but you are ruining your life every day of the day by holding on to this and by not letting go of these disappointing feelings. Apostle Price says this about circumstances in his book, The Power of Positive Confession. He says, circumstances can't hurt you. He says, circumstances merely, merely gives you the opportunity to reveal the extent of your faith in God's word. I should, I should add to that the extent or lack thereof of your faith in God's word. Circumstances cannot do a thing to me without my consent. Circumstances in and of themselves cannot cause victory or defeat. It is my response to the circumstances that determine what influence they will have on my life. Your response. And in the first century AD, there was a Greek Stoic philosopher, philosopher by the name of Epictetus who said pretty much the same thing as Apostle Price. He said all those years ago, he said, it's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. Now, both statements of Price and Epictetus reflect the truth of one other old saying, and that is, life is 10% of what happens and 90% of how you react to it. 10% of what happens, 90% of how you react to it, how you respond to it. And to this, we add Apostle Price's thought where he concludes that the ability to change one's life, which I cited already, by changing one's words, places the opportunity and responsibility for change in your life squarely in the hand and in the mouth of the individual. Finally, and I'm going to end with this one, uh, the other major obstacle that Apostle Price deals with is uh, in terms of learning to speak positively about the Word of God and bring it about change in your life today is holding on to the past. Too many people live in the past. Living in the past will defeat any effort to move forward and forward in a positive way toward change in your life. There are far too many Christian believers now, not just people in the world, who cannot let go of a hurtful or disappointing in past. 
Again, this could be a case of being abused as a youth or abandoned as a youngster when losing a parent to death or abandonment. It could be an adult who never got over a failed marriage, or it might be a case of an unjust firing from a job. Whatever happened, it happened in the past. Even if it was evil, even if it was unjust, unfair, it happened in the past. And that past could have been just last year, it could have been 20 years ago. There's a reason why it's called the past. Why is it called the past? It's called the past because that's where it belongs. It does not have to impact, it does not have to have an impact on your present or future life. But that is up to you. Forget the past, go forward. It does no good, absolutely no good to dwell on the past, on past evils. And we're given a bit of sage advice by Apostle Paul. This is Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. You're familiar with this scripture, Philippians 3, 13, 14. Apostle Paul says this, brethren, in 13, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, as you embrace the art and the practice of the power of positive confession, it is good to know that the dynamics of God's universe always flow in a positive forward stream. God's dynamics reflected in his word will never take you backwards. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We now offer the convenience of text and online giving, one of the most secure ways to give. Try it now. Simply text East G from your smartphone to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, or East O for offering. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, BrentshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This experience is easy to use, secure, and requires a one-time registration only. Giving a second time is even easier. Simply text EASTG to 28950 with all your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return in your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K. C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting EAST AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.